Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Matheson webinar called An Introduction to Specialty Gas Pressure Regulators. My name is David Hemig, and I'm joined with a panel of folks from Matheson. And when we get to the Q&A part at the end of the webinar, or at the, the last section of the webinar, you'll hear from Bill Staples, our engineering manager, and you may hear from Paulo Delazari as well, also an engineer with Matheson. You can see on the cover page just uh, uh, some nice pictures of our regulators. You know, the one in the middle is kind of our iconic one. Um, many people are familiar with the 3810 dual stage regulator. It's not only uh, good, but it's actually kind of attractive as well. So um, anyway, we thought we'd put that one front and center. Uh, the others are more specialty ones, and um, and you may be familiar with those as well. The one on the left is actually a high pressure one for dealing with high pressure cylinders, like up to 6,000 PSIG even. But we'll talk about that uh, later. Um, and the one on the right, you can see that's a single stage regulator. Okay, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to share a little bit about features and benefits of regulators. Now, we have a brief amount of time, so we're going to kind of zero in on a couple of very nice concepts that will be helpful to you. We're going to talk about how to identify an appropriate regulator for your application. We're going to mention our portfolio and how our portfolio fits into some of the applications you would have. And then we're going to share a nice resource that's available to you that you should know about because it will help you in your day-to-day -day work with regulators. Okay, I mentioned we're in Montgomeryville, Pennsylvania, the good old USA, and again, we're, we're north of Philadelphia. So, and you can see that picture was a nice, beautiful day which is the way it always is in Montgomeryville, Pennsylvania. All right, so as a regulator user, user, you've seen enough about regulators that, you know, you know, okay, there, there are a bunch out there, but why are there so many single stage, dual stage, and other regulators available from each manufacturer? Well, we're gonna talk a little bit about that in the upcoming slides, but for the most part, gases are different, and your applications are different. And because of that, you have to have a regulator tailored to what you're trying to do. A key consideration, in addition to the other ones we're gonna tell you about in the upcoming material, is choose the one that solves your problem. Now, some of these regulators can get rather expensive. So if you have a budget, then once you've identified the regulator you need, now you can consider compromising on features, but beware. If you compromise on the wrong feature, you may not be able to get the necessary purity to your point of use. And then you haven't saved anything if that's what happens. Oftentimes research requires a certain purity. If you don't get it, your research is not valid. Okay, another key question you ha will have uh, is why a dual stage over a single stage? We've got a slide or two dedicated to that, so I won't dwell on it here. And then, what is a line regulator? We're going to talk about that too. Over on the right, you'll see we actually categorize purity um, ratings. General purpose, think in terms of four nines purity, maybe a little higher, four nines five. High purity, five nines. And that's a lot of what especially gas world requires. If you're going beyond analytical instrumentation and or maybe your instrumentation needs six nines, well, now you're up in the ultra high purity world. And if you get up to electronics, solar, uh, LEDs, well, you need six nines and higher. So you're at the UHP world, ultra high purity. We're gonna mention two body types and they are forged and bar stock. Forged, basically, cast regulators, bar stock, single machined piece. All right. So the parameters that are key when you go about choosing a regulator. Well, let's talk about them. Purity. I briefly alluded to this fact in the prior slide. You have to choose one that will get 
your gas to your point of use at the purity you need. Because if you don't do that, you may have horrible results. Even the gas chromatograph impurities will ruin the readings that you get from a GC. So you're gonna choose from the general purpose, high purity or UHP type materials. Body type, I alluded to the cast versus bar stock. The cast are very common and again, suitable for 495, always brass. The bar stock brass and bar stock stainless steel regulator bodies are better. They retain fewer contaminants. And again, it's a single machine piece and they're often smoother. Okay, the materials that go in that regulator. You mentioned brass as far as the body. Stainless steel though is better. And stainless steel is gonna hold up better for high purity applications because it's not gonna grab impurities in your gas stream as the gas goes through the regulator. And then if, if a material such as like a neoprene diaphragm grabs an impurity, at some point in the future, it may just release it right when you don't want it to. So stainless steel is a good material, especially for the diaphragm. Okay, I mentioned the diaphragm, stainless steel. But not only is it less prone to absorbing and diffusing a contaminant, it gives you a better seal. So even some of our brass regulators, and I'll point those out here in a bit, uh, ha will have a stainless steel diaphragm just because it's, it's superior to the neoprene for higher purity applications, I should add. All right, pressure service. Okay, well, hey, that's kind of what you're probably expecting right up front. That's what regulators do. They take a pressure in and reduce it to a pressure out. The key thing to keep in mind is choose a delivery range that best suits the output pressure you want. For a brass gauge, you wanna operate in the middle of that gauge. That's the most accurate part of that brass gauge. Uh, matter of fact, um, uh, it's typically one full percentage point more, more accurate than the third, third of the gauge and the first third of the gauge. Now, if you have a stainless steel gauge, the entire gauge is around one, one percent plus or minus full scale. Uh, but still, if you're delivering 15 PSI to the point of use, choose a range that's zero to 30 so that you've bounded it nicely. You have nice resolution. You don't wanna use a regulator that delivers zero to 250 and operate down at the bottom of that range. Sort of makes sense, but keep that in mind. Get the delivery range that best suits what you're trying to do with that. Okay, required flow. Regulators are designed for certain flow rates. And the spec that you'll see on cut sheets is the flow coefficient or C C B. The higher that coefficient, the higher the flow the regulator is designed for. So um, if you see a 0.06 or 0.08, which is very common for quarter inch spec gas regulators, well, that's sort of a standard flow regulator. It still has a lot of flow in it, like maybe 70 liters a minute, no problem, but it doesn't do the higher rates. You see a C to V that's half inch or one inch, now you know that regulator is designed for flow. You can expect five times the ability, even more of what you get from those other C to Vs I, I mentioned. Also, an indication that you might need high flow is if your pipe diameter is half inch and you want components that are half inch. Not always the case, but a regulator that comes standard with half inch inlets and outlets that's designed for high flow. Okay, I mentioned we would talk about single stage regulators and dual stage, but we're gonna start with the single stage. Okay, for those of you that use these, the dead giveaway that this is a single stage is the, there's the body and the back and there's no depth here. And I'll show you uh, how the dual stage has more going on back here. The gas goes through your regulator into the inlet, up here, past the main valve control element, also known as a poppet, 
the um, the way the gas gets by the poppet is you put a load on the spring with the knob. The spring pushes the diaphragm down, pushing the poppet valve away from the seat, and the gas gets by. But the key thing to keep in mind with a single stage regulator is there's there's a phenomena known as the supply pressure effect. Rule of thumb is pretty simple. For every 100 PSI drop in your inlet pressure, you're gonna get a one PSI rise on the outlet across a single stage. So think about it. If you've got a 2400 PSI cylinder of nitrogen and you regulate the outlet to 50 PSI, and you walk away from it and you're sending it downstream to your gas chromatograph, well, when that cylinder drops down to 400 PSI, remember 100 PSI drop means a one PSI rise, you just had a 20 PSI rise on the outlet. So you come back to that regulator and it's delivering 70 PSI, not 50. That's the supply pressure effect across a single stage. So you think, okay, why would I want a single stage? Well, it's fine when the inlet pressure to your regulator is not changing, like you have a doer or maybe a house gas source, but it's coming in at a steady pressure. If you don't have a drop, you're not gonna get a rise. Also, a single stage is perfect if you're only working for a short period of time. If you're only using 50 PSI of gas from your cylinder, you're gonna see a half a PSI on the outlet. Maybe that's not a problem. So a short period of time, single stage is fine. Okay, the dual stage regulator. Now, in this one, this example, we have the gas flow the other direction, but still everything kind of works the same. Basically, dual stage regulator solves your supply pressure effect. Remember I mentioned on this one, you're gonna see something going on at the bottom of the regulator. Well, this is your first stage. It's fixed. There's no knob to load the spring. So say, say you want 50 PSI coming out here. This dual stage regulator may be designed so that this stage knocks it down to 300 PSI, all right? So your gas comes in, comes down here around the main control valve element or the poppet. And then it comes around up here to the second stage, which you do control. This knob is where you put the uh, load on the spring, setting the diaphragm so that you get 50 PSI on the outlet. But think about it. If you've got a 2000 PSI drop on the inlet because of your 2400 PSI nitrogen cylinder, and it gets down to 400 PSI, all right, well, the first stage is gonna see the 20 PSI rise. The second stage never sees 100 PSI variation. For that reason, you get a steady outlet pressure with a dual stage regulator. So I'll just state it one more time. If you need a stable output over an extended period of time, use a dual stage regulator. Okay. Purity surface. I want to show you a couple pictures. Here's a rough surface. Here's a smooth surface. Basically, there's one spec that tells you, okay, how, how smooth is my surface? It's the roughness average. And all it is, is an average of the valleys and peaks on a surface. A Ford's brass regulator is going to give you roughly four to five nines purity, depending on the diaphragm you choose, which is normally like a neoprene. And that's because all this roughness is going to grab impurities and moisture as it travels through. And then maybe it won't hang on to it. Maybe at some point in time, it will release it. It's just you've got a lot of place for the impurities to hang on. You do a bar stock body, you start to get to a smoother finish. You can do it with brass. Again, you got a smaller volume, smoother finish. Brass will give you five nines to your point of use. Very nice for analytical instrumentation. But even better, stainless steel. As I mentioned, it's more resistant to corrosion, and you can actually machine that, sm that smoothness 
coefficient down to 10 RA. And it starts to look something like this. It just gives you the idea. And you can go five, six, nines, even better. So think in terms of the smoothness on the internals of your regulator for how it's gonna do delivering pure gas to your point of use. All right, corrosion. For those of you who work with corrosive gases, you have likely seen this. And the key thing is moisture is what destroys even the best materials. The um, important thing is you wanna process gas with as little moisture as possible. And you wanna purge gas with as little moisture as possible. Look what happens when you use a purge gas that has a lot of moisture in it. It'll tear apart a cross purge assembly. And here is an example of a brand new cross purge assembly paired with a regulator. And this cross purge is what you need for corrosive gases. And the way it works is, all right, so maybe you've got a cylinder on and you're running gas through your CGA, through your regulator to your point of use, and it's getting ready, you need to change that cylinder. All right, so you close this valve, you close your cylinder valve, you fill and evacuate, fill and evacuate this space right here, venting your corrosive gas in this area. Once you've done that, okay, now you close this valve, you send your purge gas out the CGA and, and what we call a bleed, a CGA bleed. And what that does is you have nitrogen coming out or argon or helium, whatever gas you're using. Typically, if you're using helium, it's with an argon blend or a nitrogen blend, so you can do leak checking. But okay, so your purge gas is coming out here. You swap out your cylinder in an effort to keep the impurities in the air from trying to get in this space, change your cylinder. Okay, well, before you open this valve, you want to send your first slug out the vent. And then maybe if the purge gas is acceptable to what you're doing downstream, you might fill and evacuate, fill and evacuate. Sometimes there, there are formulas for this, but you need to do that a lot because you're basically getting the moisture out. Once you feel you've done that enough, you, you close that valve, you close that valve, of course, you uh, open your cylinder valve, open this valve, and load your regulator and send it on to the point of use. And that's how you make sure you don't get all this crud on the internals of your regulator. Because if you don't do that properly, you're going to get that. It's destroy, it'll destroy the entire assembly. Okay, corrosive gases cause failures. They shed particulates downstream, ruining your gas purity. Of course, they're dangerous to you. And you need to know what the codes say you can keep on site. So you might need a system that allows you to minimize the amount of corrosive and nasty gases you have, such as ammonia, HCl, or chlorine. Brass is never suitable for corrosive. Choose it up. Stainless steel will work. But these materials are the best. And even, even if you step up to these materials, you need a cross purge because even these materials will deteriorate when it has to battle corrosive gases and moisture. Okay, I wanted to show you a tie diaphragm concept. And this is nice to know. We mentioned the gas flows in like this around, all right? Well, right here, uh, you can put a little tack weld there, connect the poppet to the diaphragm. And remember, when you load the diaphragm, pushing this away, when you're done and you're dealing with maybe a corrosive gas that will create a little bit of corrosion, then a tack weld right here will allow the diaphragm to pull the poppet back into its seat, closing the path for the gas. Think about it. Not only is it helpful for a corrosive gas, but also if you have a small molecule like helium or hydrogen. Um, hydrogen being very small will want to make its way across there. The tide diaphragm will ensure that that path is closed. All right, a line regulator. 
I mentioned uh, we would talk about this. Many, it's very intuitive. Okay, it's in the line, but for the most part, it's a single stage regulator, no inlet gauge, just the delivery gauge right here. No CGA on the inlet. It's probably going to be a compression or a threaded fitting on the inlet. You can see, you know, it's it's just one one stage of regulation, just like a single stage regulator, and it would be appropriate following, say, a single stage regulator on a cylinder, a doer, a tank, or two trailer. When I say follow, I mean downstream. You have a regulator on these source vessels, and then you feed the line regulator. And if you think about it, you have a regulator at your source vessel, and you have a line regulator near your point of use, like in an area or before an instrument that's very important to you, you have two stages of regulation. And if you recall, once you have two, stations of two stages of regulation, you've solved the supply pressure effect. So this line regulator will take a rising inlet pressure across a single stage source regulator and dial it into exactly what you want. Okay, we're gonna play regulator bingo. And you may already realize it's not quite bingo, but it kind of does look like a bingo scorecard and that's why we call it that. And it's uh, catchy as well. So um, that is, uh, that's just a small subset of our portfolio. All gas companies have um, a portfolio of regulators, but I wanna show you how ours tie into what we just talked about. All right, our dual stage regulators. Okay, here's your giveaway that this is the brass one as this is nickel plated. Uh, the only thing the gas stream is seeing, the wetted path is a plated CGA connection, a brass fitting, a brass connection there, a brass connection there, and of course that looks brass. The inside of this regulator, this, the diaphragm is act, actually stainless steel. So this regulator will support five nines to your point of use. This one, everything stainless steel. And as we discussed, Dual stage regulator supports a stable pressure over long periods of time. So, okay, let's go to the single stage regulator. You can see it's just got the one front regulator body. The knob interfaces with that body. The uh, brass has the stainless steel diaphragm. It supports five nines purity to your point of use. But again, there's the giveaway. That's the brass, that's the stainless. But other than, other than the fittings I mentioned, it is still a very high purity regulator, supports five nines, this six nines. Let's go to line regulator bingo. And again, it's not really bingo, but it's catchy, so we call it that. Um, the line regulator, we just looked at one, the brass, the stainless, the stainless steel diaphragm as well. And again, it sets the pressure in an area downstream, or maybe you want to put it right before your point of use. So the line regulator. Okay, general purpose. All right, so maybe you don't need to deliver a five nines purity to your point of use. Maybe you just need to blanket a furnace with nitrogen. Well, then this might be sufficient. You'll see the brass is quite clear right here, uh, but inside this regulator, actually this one as well, are neoprene diaphragms. So if you recall, that's four nines five, but if you're blanketing a furnace, it probably doesn't care that you are only achieving four nines five at your point of use, and you can save a little bit of money, but still a very high quality regulator. So for industrial, lower pressure, lower purity applications. Okay, high delivery pressures. <clears throat> Cylinders can get all the way up to 6,000 PSIG. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about those, but I'm gonna talk about these because these are very common. What if you need to deliver up to 1,500 PSIG and you have a 3,000 PSIG cylinder pressure? Well, you need a regulator that can handle it. Our 3030 brass and our 3030 stainless does that. <clears throat> this is very tough to tell that this is brass. It's plated and it's also high purity. The stainless steel version, of course, um, it goes a little bit higher in purity. 
than the nickel plated brass. Okay, corrosive service. <clears throat> All right, there are a couple ways you can go. Both will work. But uh, you need to know that when you go with stainless steel, okay, you actually have enough horsepower to get it done, but you need to pair it with a stainless steel cross purge. So this <clears throat> item right here needs to be stainless steel. Pair the two together. You need to do all the purging. You can actually step up a little a little bit with a Monel regulator, a very high performance corrosion resistant regulator. Still, if you use this, you need to pair it with a Monel cross purge regulator. You can see here on the outlet of this one, there's a needle valve. I wanna mention that because this is a full turn diaphragm valve. It's either open or closed. You can actually meter your gas flow with this, not precisely, but, but based on the amount you open the valve, the uh, flow rate will change. Okay, I mentioned at the beginning, we have this resource I wanna make you aware of. I imagine other gas companies have something similar, but here's ours. And you can go to this reference on this link, the store.mathisongas.com, for whatever gas you're using, you identify the purity you need, and then it will tell you the regulator you need to get that job done. You can go to that link and you can see what the specs are. You can either get ours or you can go get someone else's, but it'll tell you what you need in order to achieve that purity. So that's because we want to be helpful. Um, Let's go over what we learned today. We talked about the features and benefits of regulators. We talked about how you would go about identifying an appropriate regulator. I showed you our regulator solutions in the context of what you might need or how you would solve your application with them. And then I just showed you a regulator resource. And if you, we, we can um, send that to you as a follow-up or you can uh, uh, send an email and we will reply. I'll show you that email address in a second. Also, in appreciation for the fact that you are our customer, uh, and also because you're on this call, we want to introduce a couple things. First, we have same-day shipping for orders received by 2 p.m. on any given workday. Second, for you, only because you're on this call, we are going to extend overnight shipping free for online equipment orders. And to do that, you need this code at checkout. The one is Matheson-hat, and the other is Matheson-bottle. As you may have guessed, that entitles you to either a hat or a water bottle. So I know I love my hat. I was thinking about wearing it today. I chose not to, but... Um, uh, it's a it's a very nice uh, nice quality hat, and if you're more uh, you'd like to bike or something like that, there's there's the water bottle. Okay, so that's just an appreciation. Good through December 31st, and then of course, as long as they last, and we've got a lot of them, so they should last for the uh, audience here. But uh, again, you've got a couple months to get that done should you choose to go down the route. All right, we have some questions from the audience that we received prior to this event. And so now I'd like to introduce Bill Staples and go ahead and answer some of these very good questions that we received. Bill, the first question we have is from a gentleman and his question was, what's the value of an isolation valve on the outlet of a regulator? Oh, thanks, Dave. Um, most of our regulators come with a full turn diaphragm valve, and our general purpose regulators have forged brass needle valve. These uh, isolation valves can be used to control flow. You get more precise control with a needle valve, but you can control your flow uh, a little bit with a diaphragm valve. Thank you. All right. Uh, and I should mention, as we go through these questions, if some of you in the audience have additional ones, go ahead and send them via, via the uh, question uh, feature, the, the chat box, and uh, we will be monitoring it and we will address them here in a bit. 
Uh, Bill, the second question we have is from a customer in the West Coast. What are the recommended ma regulator materials for analytical lab applications? Well, we rec recommend either our stainless steel regulators like the 3810A, 3510A, or 3430A series, or uh, you can go with the brass bar stock regulators like our 3120A, 3530A, or 3420A series for analytical lab applications. You wanna take a look at our regulator guide for recommendations, which will tell you when to switch from uh, brass bar stock to stainless steel. All right, thank you. Okay, this customer asked, can I get custom options on your standard regulators, such as non-standard outlet fitting? Uh, yes, we often modify regulators for our customers. The regulator part number will have a dash S suffix. The dash S is for special. <clears throat> Most modifications are for different outlet fittings. Thank you. All right. The fourth question came from a gentleman up in Canada. Is Monel or Elgiloy really necessary for use with corrosive gases? Do those materials offer any benefit that stainless steel does not? Yes, um, Monel, Elgiloy, and Hasseloy are more corrosive resistant than stainless steel. We recommend using our 3210B series, which has Monel and Elgiloy parts for severely corrosive gases like pure chlorine or hydrogen bromide. Stainless steel regulators are recommended for less corrosive gases and most corrosive mixtures. Thank you. Uh, the last question we have is um, uh, from a lady on the East Coast. When would one use a cross purge assembly? Thank you, Dave. A cross purge is an effective way of removing atmospheric moisture and oxygen from your process gas stream and will help extend the life of your corrosive service regulator. <clears throat> a cross purge should also be used with toxic gases so you can safely, safely purge out the gas during cylinder changeouts. Thank you. Paulo, I see there's a question. Did you want to handle that? I, uh, just a second. I'll tell you what, I, I see the question, so I'm going to go ahead and field it. Um, yeah, go ahead and field the questions. Uh, the question was, uh, do you have regulators with all metal seals? Uh, I think the question was, do we have regulators with all metal seals? Well, yes. we do have our, um, if you take our, our stainless steel rate, our standard stainless steel regulators, the 3810A, 3510A, is all stainless steel except for the uh, seat of the regulator. So that the seat is all stainless steel. Was, another question that came from the audience is Do colors of the regulator knobs they signify anything? Um, that's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> they, they used to. We've uh, uh, now they don't mean so much. But uh, typically, our, our blue knobs are for our uh, our analytical grade regulators, and then we have our general purpose regulators are typically black knobs, and then our um, semiconductor grade gases, formerly called our ultraline typically have a gray knob, though there's going to be some exceptions to that. And there's another question that came uh, asking, I think it's more logistic, do we ship the PO boxes? Uh, Paulo, I saw that question and uh, because they want to ship international and the answer is we don't ship to PO boxes, we ship to residences or, well, businesses, and we can also ship direct to the customer at the international location. Mm 
And that's all the questions that I see uh, uh, listed from the audience right now. No more questions have been, let me see if uh, there's saw, any additional. Uh, I saw another, Paulo, I saw a question from Jonathan. It was a general one. Why do regulators fail? And I thought, Bill, maybe you could talk to Creek. Well, you, uh, you stole my answer, Dave. Uh, there, there's many <laughs> modes of re regulator failure. The most common mode of regulator failure is what's called creep. And what creep is, is that's a, a uh, gradual increase in delivery pressure. Um, and it can go up even to your uh, inlet pressure. And how you get creep is if you get some uh, particles on the seat of your regulator, then the regulator valve won't close properly and gas will slowly leak through uh, downstream. So that's the most common mode of regulator failure. And you can see that with the corrosive regulators, when you get corrosion uh, deposits on the seat of the regulator, uh, that's most likely how they're gonna fail. Uh, Bill, I see another from uh, Magesh Rajapan. Yeah, I it says here, if I order a regulator with an oxygen fitting, does the regulator undergo any cleaning procedures during the assembly? I, yeah, our, um, yeah, well, those, yes, that regulator is uh, what we call clean for oxygen service. That's to uh, CGA G 4.1 um, standards. Okay. Uh, Paul Oh, I see uh, Rajapan had a question about, do we have regulators with all metal seals? Many have Teflon seals. Bill, you should address that. Oh, um, yeah, that's a, our analytical grade regulators do have, it's dependent on what you want to call seals. Uh, it's all metal seals. The, the seat, which really isn't a seal, um, is uh, typically like a Kel-F seats is uh, for most of our regulators but the uh, the seals so that's really like an internal seal uh, the seals that are important for the outside are uh, stainless steel but uh, metal to metal typically our analog grade regulators would be a metal to metal seal there and our uh, general purpose have uh, a neoprene diaphragm okay very good um uh, Paulo, I, um, I saw another one here. It's a very good question. Our selected C sub V, should the selected C sub V, um, how, how many more times than the calculated C sub V should it be? You, you follow that, Bill? Uh, can you, re I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Uh, this, this gentleman uh, has asked about, let's see, the uh, Sudir ask about the C sub V of a regulator. So um, if you know what the calculated, what your C sub V needs to be, is that acceptable? Or do you need a greater C sub V than what your calculations say you need? So say your C sub V is 0.06, should they get a 0.08? Really depends on their application. Um... Now the, the C sub V of the regulator is for, that's a fully open C sub V. So that's if you, yeah, if you crank the regulator and it was just as full open as possible, that's the C sub V. In all actuality, when you're adjusting pressure, you're not gonna have that full C sub V because you're, you're, yeah, you're regulating, yeah, you're not turning it full open. So yes, you should get a regulator that's, little, that's larger than your what your calculated C sub V is. Thank you. Paulo, do you have additional ones? No additional questions right now. This thank I, you. I see what I see. One more uh, just popped up from Guillermo. Uh, Bill, he wants to know if we have passivated regulators for H two S use. Uh, no, we do not sell uh, passivated regulators for H2S service. Bill, it's possible for customers to passivate regulators, correct? 
but it's just not uh, it's, it's not common for H2S. Is that right? No, we don't. There, there are some companies that sell passivated regulators for H2S service. We don't. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I um, those are some excellent questions, and I don't see any more unless you see any more, Paulo. And we are running up at uh, it's it's fifty. Uh, it's twelve fifty nine. And I, I see that everyone has stayed with us, so they must have been interested in the questions. Um, the last slide I want to show you is the info email. So if you were not able to get your question in, send it to this email address, and we will answer it. And then we will send you the QR code as a follow-up uh, that you'll get following this call. So it was a pretty impressive audience out there. Uh, we hope you learned something. Thank you so much for being a customer. And uh, we look forward to communicating with you in the future. So you know how to reach us. Thank you very much. I'm going to end the webinar now. Bye.